Thanks for tuning in to the Trap House Podcast. Now a quick word about our sponsors. We have Duke Traps. Check out duketraps.com. Duke manufactures over 40 different models of cage traps, coil spring traps, long spring traps, and body grip style traps. Also, my personal favorite, they have the Duke Dog Proofs. They come powder coated, uh, perfect on the line. Check out duketraps.com and you won't be disappointed. We have J3 Outdoors, maker of the Hags Bracket, all American made products. Check out their website, j3o.com, and you will not be disappointed. They have everything from your bait holders, your spring clips, your tail hooks, the universal locks, the list goes on. Especially if you're a water trapper, you want to check this website out. That's j3o.com. We also have Top Lot Stretcher Company with us. Check out their website at toplotstretcherco.com. Top Lot Stretcher Company handles all your wooden stretcher needs, along with pelt handling supplies and trapping supplies. Check out their website at toplotstretcherco.com. And representing all the girls in the trapping world, we have Trapping Girl Inc. with us. Check out their website, trappinggirlinc.com. They have awesome apparel for the females. There's also kids apparel, uh, lures and baits, uh, things you could use out in the field. Check out their website, trappinggirlinc.com. And there's only one true way to start out the trap line in the morning, and that's with a nice hot cup of coffee from traplinecoffee.com. Check out their numerous collections. They have Trapline Blend, a Kodiak Blend, and my favorite, a Cherry Red Blend, all available at traplinecoffee.com. Also, be sure to check out Weeby Knives. That's weebyknives.com. They have skinning knives, fleshing knives, all your fur handling tools. Check out weebyknives.com. Need a place to sell your fur? Check out Grownwold Fur and Wool Company. They're the largest and most experienced direct receiver of wild fur with over 50 plus years of experience. Their website is gfwco.com. And last but not least, Hoosier Trapper Supply. Check out our website, hoosiertrappersupply.com, home of the top dog predator bait and jet fuel predator lure. We got all your trapping needs, trapping scents and baits, deer scent, and apparel. Check out HoosierTrapperSupply.com. All right, welcome back to the Trap House Podcast. Just me and Charlie today. Yep, we're going to talk about fur, since it's appropriate time of year to talk about fur and your catch, what to do with your catch, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, a lot of people in the fur shed getting things, uh, getting their fur ready to either sell or have tanned or whatever they're going to do. We'll go through all those steps. Um, we should probably mention first thing uh, right out the gate. Um, if you're watching this the day it comes out, which is this Friday, or it is Friday. Be March March 1st, yeah. Yeah, if you're watching this on March 1st, tomorrow there is a fur sale in Columbus. Indiana. Mm-hmm. At the fairgrounds, um, Bartholomew. I don't have the address, but all, that, all the link will be in the description below. And uh, if you want to attend at first thing in the morning, basically uh, show up, sign in about 8.30. Auction starts rolling about 9.30. 30. And we, it, it varies on how many buyers we have. We usually have five to eight. Just to, just depends on the year. But uh, it's always a good time regardless. So more than welcome to come out. Um, if you're a member, obviously you get a little bit better of a price break there as far as... Um, commission, right? Commission, yeah. So keep that in mind. Then also on Sunday is um, here at Hoosier Trapper Supply, uh, Grunewald Fur and Wool Company is pulling in with their truck and buying right here in the lot. So, right. And that's from 10 to 11.30 on Sunday. Right. So. so for those of you that are out of state, because I know we have a lot more listeners out of state than we do within the state of Indiana, uh, check your um, state associations. A number of them already have had their sales, but there will be some yet to, to hold them um, for sales yet, yet this season. The uh, uh, and then also check um, Grownwald's uh, website for when he'll be in your area to buy fur, and mm -hmm. then also Fur Harvesters Auction Company will have uh, on their website will have where they're going to um, pick up fur. They don't buy on the spot; that goes to the auction. But if you want to meet the truck and get your fur on the auction, um, you can do that. So, and they will be here sometime in April. So you have to check the website. But um, yeah, and all, all those links are below. So. Yeah, I'll have them up. So Easy there, there find. are definitely options in selling fur. So. so what's the first thing, Charlie? So 
I mean, a lot of this is going to, would probably be better to watch a video or whatever. So we're going to, we're going to just kind of go through some basic um, fur handling ideas. Um, some, some important things. Well, so first off, so you got to catch your animal. Right. What are you going to do? So if it's super muddy, super dirty, whatever, best thing to do is wash it immediately while it's still on the carcass. Um, and you can wash it in the creek, or you can wash it up with a hose or you've yeah. got a utility sink at home get that thing washed out blow it off the best you can with an air compressor or whatever uh, if you don't have that um, just do the best you can we normally put our stuff up on milk crates uh, mm -hmm. so it's off the ground and they get fans around it and that blow it out that way yeah. put it in a cool room to, to, uh, to do that the big thing is don't it's better to get it dry while it's on the carcass than it is um, right if you skin it so I know there's guys that wash skins after the fact, after they're skinned, but um, this, this I, I think it actually dries a little bit better and um, you don't have to worry about slipping quite as bad. So yeah, so get that thing. Get, it, I'll, I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate and ask random questions um, that you could follow up. Now, when you're talking about rinsing and washing fur, are you talking about actually using soap? You could. I mean, that's more applies to like, if you want to get into high-end coyotes and bobcats and stuff right now with what that stuff's worth it's just not worth spending the time with doing that so yeah but you want to be practical about it you don't want to take the fur buyer or something muddy or matted down or full of burrs or all of that you're still marketing a product so right. you want it to look as good as you can but it's got to be within the realm of reality of how much time you want to spend on a ten dollar raccoon so i mean that's yeah. that's kind of all relative and some people love doing that and that's fine uh, obviously makes a beautiful product so right yeah even if the guys that you know we've rinsed things up dipping in the creeks where you catch it at, at the site and uh, did the whole milk crate thing obviously you're not gonna get all of it out which is fine to a degree because I've noticed when you when it is dry and you go to comb it all that dry dirt that had been in there will flake out of there a lot easier mm -hmm. you can almost shake it out uh, obviously when it's wet it clings on to the hide and fur so right same thing applies to blood if if as long as it's not like saturated in blood if it's just kind of some spotty blood when that dries it'll comb out and that it, it it you can get it out of there so um, but if you've got blood soaked areas then it's definitely a good idea to wash that and get it cleaned up so the whole the whole bottom line is get that thing looking as good as you can for just a, a practical amount of time spent so comb it out um, get the burrs and stuff out of it. If you are, at this point, if you are freezing it to sell it frozen, um, and you, for instance, Gronwald prefers stuff just actually being frozen flat so that they can tell the size and they can tell, you know, what it, what it looks like. Uh, in the case of beavers, you can, you can lay them flat and just fold them in half and, and freeze them that way so they can tell size or whatever you can go first side out right? right first side out if you you can go another fold on beavers but i think if you got room i would just fold them one time and just lay them out like that and then freeze them now when you stack these in your freezer and i, I don't um one layer at a time so in other words it goes in you got one layer down you got to let those freeze before you add more so if you stack two three layers deep it will it, even though it's in the freezer it's not going to freeze quick enough and it will actually spoil in your freezer so very important so that it, it freezes quickly so um yeah very important yeah um obviously if you're dealing with large hides like coyotes and and such you know not everyone's got the biggest freezer in the world uh we did share a video from our kansas trip with mike huber he does a fascinating job with how he compacts and gets most <laughs> the most amount you can possibly fit in a freezer. It's a great method. It's real simple. Lays it in flat, puts a board on it, and then puts something heavy like a rock, and that will slowly compress it as it freezes down. And like Charlie said, you do it in layers. One layer at a time. Yep. So then just yeah. start adding. Then, then basically you got a brick of fur in that whole freezer. Right. Yeah, he so. can get as much in there as possible. It's basically like... Um, shrink wrap and something is what he's doing without the shrink wrap machine yep. and he was literally actually using tractor weights so he had that board that fit the freezer and put tractor weights in on top of that which are heavy so that was really weighting that down and that works great for him and he's been doing it for years so he's got a good system so yeah i can't recall the actual episode but as when we were in kansas a couple of years ago if you sift back through the episodes you should be able to find it and 
Right. It might it might be in the how-to section too on its own. It may be. Yeah. So. If so it's not. It should be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we got your fur for those of you that are going to sell it frozen or keep it frozen. That that we're, that's where we're at. Okay. Uh, ideally, don't roll it up in a ball and put it in a bag and try to sell it like that because they just can't tell enough about it. So yeah, um, they'll give you the bare minimum that way because right. they don't know what they're buying. Right. If they'll even buy it. Right. That's true. So, okay. So for those of you that want to go ahead and put it up, which would mean scrape it, stretch it, dry it, to back up on the frozen fur, don't scrape it. Just leave the fat on because a couple things. One, it's not necessary to do that. Number two. Um, it helps prevent freezer burn. So that fat actually helps freezer burn. So just quick reference, if you are gonna keep frozen fur for a year, in other words, to next season without selling it, you will need to wrap it up, a um, couple layers of plastic bag or whatever, wrap it up, push the air out, and then stick it back in the freezer. So try not to keep an eye on your freezer. A lot of times freezers, the ones that are self defrosting are more likely to dry stuff out. So you know, just yeah, kind of kind of use your judgment, but just make sure you get it wrapped up really well. So, what we're talking about freezing and with be able, you know, being able to sell the skin within two or three months. With that's that's with the skin exposed in the freezer. Yeah. So okay, good point. So uh, so if you want to go ahead and finish your stuff out, um, basically you'll need a fleshing beam, you'll need a fleshy knife. Ideally, you'll need an apron and you'll need stretchers and um so they're the the fleshing tools if you're doing anything other than muskrats um the two handle fleshing tools with two edges so it's important to have the upper edge be sharp and the bottom edge be your scraping edge the edge that you can actually use about 80 percent of the time but when you need that top sharp edge um you'll need that like on the backs of a, the neck of a raccoon you'll need it on going down the back of a beaver uh, places like that where you're actually going to be shaving more than you will be pushing it off. So yeah. it's important to have a knife with two edges. Mm -hmm. So you can buy Weeby Pro, kind of an entry level um, knife, two edges. You can buy a Weeby, a Weeby Elite, knife, very nice knife, or you can get like a Necker, another very nice knife. So all of those would fit the bill um, yeah. for what you know what you need. I will say, that if beginners are interested in, you know, most guys listening that do this probably already have what they like in their shed. But for beginners, I've used every knife that we've sold and then some that's been given to us. And I it really boils down probably a little bit to what you get used to in technique. It does. Um, they're all pretty good knives, to, you know, so it's kind of personal preference. Uh, and you'll get a feel for how you work it you know usually one person will fall in love with one knife and it's hard for them to get away from it half the time because that's what they got used to right so but right Good. so i wouldn't overthink too much when you're going to select you know just just buy what you do edge buy the best you can afford i think yeah. that's probably the best way to say it so mm -hmm. so for doing muskrats you will need um there are some people that use the two handled knives just a single edge to do muskrats on um that's fine if you're set up for that i think generally um a muskrat beam that which are specific uh by the way the other beam will fit everything else so you need a muskrat beam the skin actually goes over the beam and you're going to use just the little one handle fleshers and, and that'll work that work good because on a muskrat there's not much to take off there's some there's some fat in the saddle or shoulder area and then down along the bottom that's what needs to come off uh, the red membrane red membrane stays on so they don't need a whole lot of attention um, so you know yeah. that that's the main thing here again those skins that fur needs to be dry before you put it on the stretcher so mm -hmm. and that doesn't make any difference whether you're using a wire or wood it needs to be dry so wire or wood yeah you want it to be I mean age-old debate it sounds like from even before my times <laughs> yeah like which way do you go wire or wood well, it really depends on what you're doing and, and and some preference obviously too right so there's not a definitive definitive answer to that i will say that there's not a fur buyer 
of any size that's using wood to speak of. They might be using it on their bobcats, but in general, it's just not, uh, they can't justify the time putting stuff on wood. So mm -hmm. that, with that said, I mean, that's, that's commercial fur production and, um, they're using, they're using wire and all the years I bought fur, I cannot imagine taking the time to tack stuff out on wood. The only thing that was a, for us, that was a consistent was mink. We always put mink on wood, even back in the day when we were super busy with other stuff. A lot of times we would freeze mink and we'd actually go put them up later in the season when we weren't having to deal with, um, really big numbers of carcass uh muskrats and raccoons because i mean in the scheme of things you don't buy that many mink you know um, you might buy ten thousand muskrats and you still might only buy two or three hundred mink so um just to put that in context so the mink are the only thing that i think should be put on wood uh, there are wire stretchers available they just don't look very good on wire they just it's just they bow out you, i don't think you're getting the size yep they, they just don't look that great on on wire Wire's okay, but, and here again, mink prices are really bad. Wild mink prices are really bad. So, it doesn't even time. make that much of a difference. So, yeah. So Now, could the, the wire, could you, I've never done this without masking, but uh, we've always, even here, um, just tanning for, for a customer, we've always used wood. Uh, with the wire, do you think it could be manipulated, bent in enough to where it would, take care of some of that bow maybe i mean that stretcher is such so long and skinny it's hard to get that it's hard to get that shape right if you if yeah. you mess with them so uh on a on a coon stretcher that's wider that you've got some width to deal with you can get the shape much nicer than you can on a wire mink stretcher so hmm. anyways yeah one thing about wire um make sure there's no rust on them so if they if you got rust on your stretchers steel wool them uh oil them up you can use coon fat even on them but get that get that rust off that rust will permanently stain a tan fur so we've talked about this before um literally if you have if you get uh, for instance if you get a coyote tanned that was on a rusty stretcher you will see the rust marks on the sides of that skin from that stretcher so it, it's a permanent stain so pretty, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty thing to pretty definitely something you want to avoid. Now, um, going back to the wire wood debate, uh, assuming say prices for raccoons were much better. Personally, I, if I had the time, I would take my very best raccoons and put it on wood just because you can get a nicer look in terms of the bottoms of them. And you can maybe gain, you know, if you're within a quarter inch of a two XL, you know, on wire, you can definitely probably get that 2XL on wood. So with tacking it down, it's not going to dry out of that size. So that, those are the times that I would probably consider using um, wood. Bobcats, here again, a higher priced item. If you want to use wood, you don't have to worry about the edge um, on wire. Maybe that's one to put on, on wood. The... Mm -hmm. um, uh, muskrats, uh, and I've had people swear, it's like, oh, put them on wood. I would tell you, most buyers do not like muskrats on wood because you can't stack them because they're thick. Yeah. So they look really nice on wire. They dry nice on wire, and you they can stack them. and They'll stack them 10, 10, 10, 10, and then you can stack them in 10, 5 tall, uh, and that's 100. <laughs> so you can put 100 muskrats in a stack and get it in nice and condensed, and you have to worry about it falling over. If you use wood stretchers, it, it's it's not that easy. So they look great on um, wire, and I I would recommend uh, wire for muskrats as well. So yeah, uh, be a good time to mention too. Don't forget to flip your hide on things that are drying out, depending on what you're working with, obviously. So your predators, your you know your coyotes, your fox. There's been times where in bobcats, bobcats, you, you get, you know, time goes by the wayside and you kind of forget. And the next thing you know, your hide's too stiff to even turn and you force it and then end up ripping your hide. And it was, you know, a waste to begin with. So, right. Um, there are ways around that. You know, you can rehydrate. We've wrapped damp towels on there just enough to get enough moisture back into the hide so you can flip it. Um, you know, sometimes you can go that route. 
fans are, are your friend as far as drying that stuff back out. Once once it's flipped. Be careful yes. with that fan on a skin before it's turned first side out. Right. So I guess to clarify, everything is sold skin out if it's stretched and dried, except for coyotes, foxes, bobcats, wolves, which, you know, we don't have to deal with that, but wolves, wolverines, some of that specialized stuff. But for most of us, foxes, coyotes, bobcats have to be fur out. Everything else is skin out. And what Justin's referring to is when you, you, start, the, you start that skin, uh, skin out, and you let it get dry to the touch, but it's still got to be very essential. Mm -hmm. So it's pliable enough that you can turn it first side out. Right. Now, Top Lot Stretcher has a drying system so that you can start a coyote, bobcat, or fox on a stretcher first side out. And he actually has a hose uh, going down the stretcher that gives it uh, air. Right. And, and you can dry those skins and you don't have to worry about turning them. That is an awesome system. So they've used that within the ranch mink and the ranch fox industry for years, but now he's got it available to trappers. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's a little more money, but man, it's nice. Yeah, so. there is a once again if you go to our YouTube page, Who's Your Trapper Outdoors, um, there is a video of um, Leon from Top Lot Stretcher, kind of demoing that setup and showing you at a convention. So you, you can check it out on on uh, YouTube. Um, shout out to our sponsors. Yep. <laughs> uh, we, and we also like their adjustable wood stretchers for the higher items. You know, high dollar bobcat, wow. you get out west or something. It's good that have that mix. Um, you know, you can adjust to that size of that cat and get the best out of it. Um, so, yeah. We should probably back up just a little bit because we kind of skipped one here, Charlie. We were talking about fur, tools and fur handling equipment, beam setups. Actual fleshing beam setup. Okay. There's a lot of different. Well, yeah, you're looking. There's, there's one, one behind yeah, us. It's hard to see it, but. And uh, if you if you look in on our uh, YouTube page under the fur the fur shed series, there is a. I actually make a beam out of an ash log, which is actually what we use in the in our room here. Um, and I'll and it, it's basically you've got the stand. I just took the log, um, ran a. Um, split it in half and then clean the bark off of it and it was pretty smooth as it was smoothed it out and, and i'm just using half log so um simple one thing you can do on the beams that are available from like us and other trapping supply places is you can take a like a barn door hinge put it at the bottom of the beam and attach the other part of it to the wall about 12 to 18 inches off the floor and then that beam when you're when you're not using it you can just wire it have like a loop or whatever so you can attach it to the wall when you want to use it then have it drop down on a fairly something fairly substantial like a, a good quality um, sturdy sawhorse uh, or some sort of table that will hold that beam in place and, and um, take that pressure of you pushing down with your fleshy knife so um, that works great and then that beam lifts up and you can clean underneath it real easily um, yeah. The big thing about beams is when those drop down and you're using them as, to flesh on, they got to be stable. You don't want them moving and rocking. I saw somebody having one hanging by a chain uh, on YouTube. It looks like a yeah, cedar tire. Yeah, it's, it? yeah, it's just not functional. So uh, it's important that when that beam is there, it needs to be. You know, that's why it's up against the wall. Uh, Keep it it solid. needs to be. Yeah, it needs to be very stable and solid and not not move. Yeah. So you that's how to, you end up with holes. Exactly. Exactly, and you can't if it's moving. You can't get the, the correct pressure against that what you're pushing off. So, yeah. So, what do you think about um, like PVC pipe type beams and stuff? I've never worked off one. I haven't either. It, uh, I guess my initial reaction is always that um, it's it's what you get used to and what you like to do. It seems like it would get a little slick, but it would also be very easy to clean. So I know um, uh, Stu's uh, Coon Creek is really big on. PVC beams. In fact, he made a few that he sold that we sold for him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you can get some of the PVC in that thickness, is pretty expensive. So um, I don't know my PVC sizes, but <laughs> it's 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 the better some of the better um, quality PVC. Yeah, isn't it? So, fairly thick stuff. Yeah. Thing. So if you got access to some scrap or whatever, that's the way to get it. But if if you got to go buy it, uh, it's going to be a little more money. And you're spending, and you can use it as leave it as a tube, 
or uh, you know, as, yeah, as a tube, or you could you could um, you can cut it. So yep, either way. Yeah, and then you could sand your edges, get it. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah, die grind it or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. Put too much pressure on a fairly uh, sharp edge, you're gonna pop a hole, obviously. Uh, I think we kind of already talked about we have it on our list here about where to sell fur we've already kind of talked about that at the beginning of the, of the podcast uh so i think we kind of got that covered was there anything else up here justin you think we should uh as far as the the stretcher issue or not issue but preference ultimately it's figure probably figure out where you want to go with your fur to begin with and then ask them what they want yeah good good suggestion. that you know because if you got a say you got a local buyer and he's like hey i want everything on wood for whatever reason if that's what he wants you know maybe maybe try and you know accommodate that and maybe give you a better price for it so it just kind of depends what you're doing like if you sell a grown wall doesn't matter right what's that between wood and wire yeah yeah no, no. Just it's more about speed. You don't have to stretch it for length on a coon. You well, know, no, meat sizes. well, well you, the length is still important. The size is still important. So, but he he doesn't. He's not looking. He doesn't care if it's on wire or wood. Okay. So he's still great in size. Okay. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so ask your buyer and go from there is what I would do. Yeah. Oh, and one more skin that definitely should go on wood is our otters. They, yeah. I mean, I've seen guys put them on wire, and the tail gets all um, funky looking. If you did put them on wire, you're gonna have to put another piece of wood just so you can get the tail tacked out. So the best thing to do is get some wooden uh, otter stretchers. Um, they come in multiple sizes too. Yeah, they're usually small, medium, and large. If you're only buying one size, just get the medium size. But um, otter are like mink; they just need to be on wood. So, yeah, that length. Yeah, that narrowness of them it just and with makes that sense. Yeah, yeah. So um, on here we also have where to sell, which we've been talking about. We could put now Indiana used to have a, a link that had all the fur buyers in the state. Yeah, you can still you can still type it in on Indiana. Just go to the Department of Natural Resources list of Indiana fur buyers, licensed Indiana fur buyers. It'll okay. come up. Okay, I'll Excuse try and find that link and put that in the description as well uh, so people can find it easier. But um, you can go to your state, DNR, uh, or Fish and Game, whatever you call it in your state, and they probably do the same as far as licensed fur buyers. You know, back years ago, there was a fur buyer in every county. Some counties had more than one. It is not like that anymore. It's going to require some traveling. So, unfortunately, we have lost that kind of that tradition of, of the just the local fur buyer. But... Um, so that that's certainly an option if you're fortunate enough to have one nearby um, that you can just take your fur over and sell him the whole the whole animal the whole raccoon. So <laughs> yeah, of course, of course we talked about traveling buyers like growing wall running routes. There are some other buyers, um, not as much here in the east, but um, uh, there are a few that still run routes um, in the western states. I think there might be a couple more um, than the fur the you know the fur auctions. Trapper Association fur auctions. Good way to sell fur. Uh, it all depends on who shows up to buy. So check your state and local Trappers Associations to see if there's any upcoming sales yet this spring. And then, of course, fur, har fur, fur harvesters auction. So if you want to sell fur, there are places to sell it. Unfortunately, the price in a lot of cases is not good. Yeah. Beaver being right this year, uh, winter of 2024, beaver or the beaver or the animal. They're the one that they're the ones most in demand so which is cool when you think about it yeah. i've always talked about how cool the beaver is and the, and the history behind it just i always love to think of like obviously in modern day this is as close as we're going to be to being a, a mountain man <laughs> yeah but uh to know like back in the day guys would explore out west strictly to find beaver right and it's just right. amazing so it's kind of like it's I mean, there's been points over the years where beavers were worth good money, but this right now they're proportionally they're the, the best. So it's kind of come full circle, I guess, in a way. So yeah, it's kind of yeah. cool, kind of cool. So okay, so let's say something like this happens. Go out, you had a great season, caught a handful of different items, you pit it all up. Something happens, you you miss the deadline of these sales or where you can get to an auction. How should people 
hold on to that fur till next season. Okay, if it's stretched and dried, or uh, just stick it in the freezer. Just straight up. Yep, just put it in a bag. It's not near as critical as far as having stuff that's not put up. Stuff that's green, just skinned, that's going to need more attention as far as free, freezer burn. But your stretched and dried skins can just go directly into the freezer. That way you don't have to worry about bugs or uh, it slows oxidation down significantly. So that that's your best bet. Just put it in the freezer. Now what about the items that are like cocoons, muskrats, where the hide is out? That's fine. You'd still want to wrap that before you put it in the freezer? Uh, you can, no, you could just put it in there. You're not like worried that. about no, stuff no, drying no, out? Not so much. Any, no. Well, it's already dried. Yeah. It's almost like it's uh, freeze-dried. Yeah. <laughs> It will, in a way yeah, well yeah that's a, yeah that's kind of different but yeah, yeah. so yeah okay. just put it in the freezer that's the main thing because bugs will get into it no matter how you well you think you're bug free or whatever bugs will find their way to get into it and it oxidizes so it's going to get lighter the skin's going to get more yellow in color which is very noticeable on otter and mink as just even within the season sometimes if you're they will turn more yellow or or um on those two skins particularly um so one thing we didn't mention was beaver that's the only thing that's not really stretched in a case skin those are stretched round so or oval so right um that's that that's important but uh, nowadays so many there you do get you do get more on stretch and dry but the the green price is pretty good so you can a lot of people are just selling their beavers just skinned so yeah just like you said skin them out fold them in half get them to your buyer right that's probably like i said check with whoever you're dealing with <laughs> right uh, well what what if something happens and your freezer is you don't have a freezer and you risk it some guy has you know 10 coyotes hanging in the rafter in his garage and but a little bit of bugs start to get in there what should he do to you, try and save that you're gonna have to spray it down with bug spray like flying insect spray that's probably your best bet so Spray it down, maybe get it in a uh, trash bag, kind of fumigate it, yep. gas right. it out. Spray it before the bugs get there, and then right. periodically spray it. You can yeah. use those room uh, fogger things, too. It's This is way less than ideal. And I, oh, at this yeah. point, considering what fur's worth, I'm not sure it's worth yep. fighting it to do that. But so. Right, right. Well, sometimes it's hard to let go of your precious, precious catches. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, there is something to be said for seeing all that fur hanging there, and then all of a sudden the room's empty, and it's like, oh, that's kind of a letdown. So. Yes, yes. What else we need, Charlie? So a lot of people have stuff tanned. Right. So, you know, you can drag, drag it into a place like ours, a uh, taxidermy shop, that um, a lot of guys bring them in here whole, that, you know, it's not skinned, and they just want one coyote tanned or whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, most taxidermists will accommodate you on that. Um, but a lot of guys will, um, they want their stuff tanned and they send it directly to a tannery. So you can do what we just talked about as far as skinning, scraping, stretching, and drying and send that to the tannery. It's going to, it's got to be that way to send it to them. They're not going to accept a carcass animal. Uh, there are a few tanneries that will accept green stuff that's just skinned. You'll have to check that in advance. Um, Obviously, they're going to charge you a higher fee on that, but um, make sure you know that you've got delivery capabilities in place. You don't want it spoiling in transit. Uh, maybe you got one close enough where you can just deliver it directly to them. Um, so that that's step, another option. But one thing we do quite a bit of this. So, for instance, if somebody brings us a beaver in and they want it tanned, we skin it we scrape it and we actually just lay it flat and salt it we don't stretch it um that is it saves some time but more than anything when that tan skin comes back there's not nail holes all the way around the skin so right and you just like i said just lay it flat uh like put uh, white uh we use uh, livestock salt from farm store tractor supply company sells and most farm stores have it comes in 40 pound bags just use that it's cheap you and be very generous with the salt so um, yeah and if you have a saturated hide which can happen sometimes with a beaver big fatty beaver just greased out you know dump a heavy amount of salt in there then you might have to come back the next day if that salt is saturated with that you can knock all that off and apply a fresh layer so what that, that helps a lot and it speeds up your time too it will dry much faster than laying against the floor right so that what the salt does is actually pulling pull moisture out of the skin so don't put salt on top of uh, skin that's not fleshed because basically that 
the fat will protect the skin from the salt and it'll just spoil anyways. So don't do that. So the skin has to be uh, properly fleshed before you salt it. Right. One thing we do too is any, you know, we case skin everything that's going to be um, tanned. If somebody wants it open up later, we can open it up later so it lays flat. But one thing we do on um, case skinned fur when it goes on the stretcher, we always salt under under the arms, around the head, down the tail, um, anywhere where skin will touch skin. Right. That bottom lip will lay back down and touch on the on the neck. Salt that really good around the ears. Yeah. Lip lines, nose. Yeah. You'll just get a better quality skin back from the tannery uh, if you do that. We have had over the years. We'll have um, skins brought in that are scraped and dried, and and whoever brings them in, they do a really nice job. But a lot of times when those come back, the tail is not quite as good as it could be. Some parts of it may slip. It just doesn't. It just doesn't do as well uh, without that salt running down, down actually just down the tail. You got to pull the bone, open the tail up. Even if you put it on a wire stretcher, run salt down that yeah. tail. So definitely open up the tail. Yeah, because yeah. if you don't, it will spoil. And it's hanging. Obviously, you put salt on it, or even if you didn't, whatever method it is, all that moisture and all the stuff that it's pulling out of that hide just goes down the hide right down in that hole of the tail and starts slipping at the base. Right. It will right. literally fill that tail up with, with uh, what little fat renders out of the skin pores. So right. and moisture. So Yeah. Very important. So yeah, when you so when you're think when you're sending stuff off to get tanned, consider that salting method, particularly on beavers. Uh, I would do it on everything, even if it's on a stretcher. On if you want to sell skins, do not put salt on it. No. They'll they'll, they'll they may not even buy it but that it's considered a second at best. So it discolors the skin, they, they don't want it. So, but if yeah. you're having stuff tanned, it's it's okay to salt it. So. Yeah, and, and same thing with the tail, like we said, open that. Keep that in mind with, if you keep the feet on hides, and coyotes or whatever, I see that happen where they'll, they'll split up down the arm, then they'll have the toes where they, make sure you get out all that bone, split the membrane, get all that junk out of there the best you can. And when you salt it, actually fold that paw out so that all that moisture and junk and fat residue has somewhere to go. If it's a pocket, it just collects and it's just, yeah, it's a bad spot for uh, slippage and uh, rot, basically. Right. <laughs> and tanning, tanning is one of those things that there are so many factors in it and so many, most of the time stuff comes out okay, but there's times that it doesn't. And it can be anything from the health of the animal, the, the condition the animal was in, uh, certainly how long it sat around before it was taken care of, what the temperature was in the room that you're drying them in. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many factors play into uh, the quality of tan that you get in the end. And I mean, we're, we've been, I've been doing this uh, since the 70s and uh, we've been doing taxidermy since 1995. So I mean, we deal with this a lot, and there are times that it gets frustrating, you know, um, stuff that may or may not turn out um, the way uh, we would like it to, but generally, um, yeah. I mean, generally it does, I mean, but there are times where, you know, there there may be an issue with something. So. Yeah, but. I think the biggest thing is, whatever it is you deal with or catch, t take care of it right away. Don't wait, beat around the bush with it, because then... You know bad things can happen if you don't have time to do that get it dry and get it in the freezer and deal with it later when right. you have the time right and that, that will save you so much headache some guys um and it's i it, some guys kind of freak out if the belly on a coyote or a, a red fox are bad about doing it um muskrats are kind of bad about doing it bobcats to a certain point in the belly area with their skin will actually have a green residue on it Sometimes that's there almost immediately. It's from the, you know, the intestinal acids and whatever that may come through. Uh, obviously, if that is on the skin and you're not seeing any slippage or whatever, you can rub salt on that, or you can use 20 mil team borax, and that will help slow that down. Uh, we've had a lot of skins over the years that have had that, and they come out of the tan just fine, no issues. Um, yeah, but just be aware that that can be an issue. So, muskrats, if they start getting green on the belly, they they you know that's that's gets a little riskier for sure so 
they're very thin membraned on the belly and when it gets to the skin you know there's there's not a lot of protection there for them so some stuff lands uh hook i mean can lay on the floor for a while it's got a floor life when it's on carcass beavers hold up well but some stuff like muskrats um, don't and the most predators don't do super well i think it's just got a lot to do with their digestive system and what they're eating and what the bacteria that's there so yeah so just be aware of that so i think that kind of wraps it up yeah um so if you when you guys are watching this if you i mean obviously if you listen to it on a one of a podcast platform we don't have um there's not really a capability of um questions there but if you do happen to watch this on youtube and if you've got further questions uh, about what we're talking about today, there's always a lot of questions about this. Put them in the, the comments section below, and when we do our next podcast, we'll uh, at least take a few minutes and answer, try to answer those. So. Yeah. Um, for people chiming in or listening in that haven't really handled or skinned it much, or they're just planning on doing that for the first time this year, um, we do have a DVD called Show Me the Money. Uh, I filmed it. Charlie's on there, basically showing you start to finish on all, you know, basically every fur bear in Indiana at least that you can mess with. Uh, then there's some bonus stuff on there, like how to turn the ears and things like that on the cartilage. And um, you can also watch a free one there on YouTube. We have on our how-to section. I skin one, a coyote in the field, no fancy setup. You just hang it by a foot. You got a knife, no p fancy machine or skinners none of that stuff uh, so anyone can do it uh, so that's out there then as far as other fur handling tips we recommend our buddy Stu Miller over at Coon Creek Outdoors check out his YouTube channel he has great fur handling knowledge and uh, plenty of videos to back it up right right so I think in our how-to section there's one on muskrats one on coyotes um, there's Slow. there yeah. might be some other ones too so but yeah definitely check out Coon Creek Outdoors he's he's uh, that's kind of his. I mean, he's obviously has trapping content, but his fur handling is um, really good. So yeah, I think that's he'll, he'll tell you that's what kind of blew the channel up in the first place. So. Right, right. So good stuff. Yep. Anything else, Charlie? I think that's it. If you if you'd like, if you got further questions, leave them below in the on YouTube, and we'll we'll try to get to them on the next podcast.